Welcome to Carito Connects. I'm your host, Jen, and I've been conversing with friends around the world about life challenges and impactful moments. Conversations on this platform look at answering the questions, how we overcome challenges and how our experiences shape who we are and the work we do today. I hope this work can inspire you on your own personal and individual journey. Let's dive right in. Hello, my guest today is Zara Seligson. Did I pronounce that correct? Yes. (laughs) Okay, thank you. (laughs) A certified holistic nutritionist, herbalist, yoga, and Ayurveda instructor who specializes in women's reproductive health and education. Zara uses these holistic health tools to work one-on-one with clients, as well as teach and lead group courses that address different physiological, spiritual, and emotional issues that women face. Hi, Zara. Hi. (laughs) I'm excited to have Zara on Kirito Connects today to share about her work with us, as I think women's reproductive health is really important, and we don't talk about this enough in our very modernized, uh, technologically connected world we live in today. But most importantly, how an adrenaline collapse experience she had in her early 20s led her to walk this path. So Zara, I will stop here and uh, let you share your journey with us and why your experience has been so impactful for yourself and transformative in the work you do with other women. Okay. Well, thank you for that beautiful introduction. Yeah, I'll start with that experience. So in my early 20s, I think I was about 22, I had a almost full, what I call adrenal collapse, which is basically my adrenals kind of gave out. I was pretty much at zero. Um, and that's a very particular health situation that has a lot involved in it. Um, It's kind of a picture of a lot of different things. So I just, I had no energy. A lot of systems in my body pretty much just stopped working. And it was, it was particularly intense, I think, because I was so young and I was at a time in my life where I expected that I was going to have a ton of energy and motivation and inspiration and all of this direction on my path and everything pretty much came to a halt. So not only was it physically really impactful, but mentally and emotionally, it was extremely challenging because I was having an experience that I didn't see like mirrored in my peers or really anyone Mm. else I knew. Mm -hmm. So it really forced me into a different lifestyle. I had definitely been living a lifestyle of kind of like typical late teens. I partied a lot. I had a fake ID. (laughs) I was kind of all about that life. Um, And I was actually really getting tired of it and recognizing that I needed something different. Like that voice started whispering in my ear, like, is this all that there is? Is this really what I'm going to be doing? So it forced me into a lot of contemplation and it really forced me onto a completely different path than I had been on because it it wasn't even an option anymore. Like I couldn't stay up past 8 p.m. at night. I had no energy. So it wasn't even a question of do I want to do that anymore? It was more an answer of absolutely not. You can't. There's no way. So can I ask for those of us who are unfamiliar with an adrenal collapse, yes. uh, what does, what happens? Like what, what happens to your body? Like, so is it kind of like, uh, also like depression, but also on the physical side, you, you know, you're, you have like no energy, like you said earlier, your, your body collapses. What, what symptoms do, do you normally experience? So an adrenal collapse is, it's really the end result of for most people, years of living a certain way. So years of, you know, not getting enough rest, basically years of kind of high stress living, or even just 
you know, a lot of times like someone will finish a degree in school and they will have an adrenal collapse. Like when you really push through a period of time, a lot of times the end result is this exhaustion because basically you've been running on a hormone called cortisol that just gets you through and you keep going, keep going, keep going. And when that event ends, the cortisol goes from being very high to extremely low. And that results physically in very, very low energy. But then what also happens as a result of it is the digestive system really slows down. The reproductive system really slows down. Like mental clarity, you know, lots of fogginess. And I think as a result of that, what I've seen, because I specialized in this for many years working with clients, is that depression is definitely a result of it. You know, Mm -hmm. anytime you're in a sustained period of physical illness, really, I think depression becomes a part of it because your whole world has shifted and, you know, your identity is different. Kind of the person you thought you were, the way you thought that you lived is all of a sudden completely different and you have to reorient to that. So, you know, symptoms of it was I I had the energy to maybe like go on a walk or I was really into lap swimming and I, I could do that. And that was pretty much all I could do. And the rest of the day was just like, I needed to be resting. You know, I got to the point where I was eating maybe like three foods. Like I could eat like brown rice, tofu, and a vegetable. It was like just everything narrowed so much. Um, And the thing is you're exhausted, but a lot of times you can't rest. You can't sleep. It's like tired and wired because your Mm. system is so wiped out. It actually can't like turn off down. Exactly. So, you know, insomnia, all kinds of things like that. Um, And then when you do sleep, you're not rested. You know, you could sleep a full night and you wake up exhausted. So as someone looking around me and seeing my friends still partying, still in that whole scene and me being like, I have to go to bed at 8 p.m., it was, it was very challenging and yeah. So, and it actually lasted about, it was three years. Wow. Yeah. I was going to, I was, was going to ask, yeah, I was going to ask you like when, cause I mean, I guess if, if we had met you in your twenties, you would be in a very different place from where you are now, right? Like what we see on your website and how you're presenting yourself would have been a very different person then. Like, <laughs> very, very, very different. I mean, I but, think I think sim- there are similarities in the sense that things that were inside of me then, they were just like very deeply buried and not yeah. f- formed. They were right, kind of right. in like their baby Play-Doh phase or something. <laughs> so I think, but I was also very different. I mean, I've gone through a lot on many levels between now and then I do feel like a very different person. Yeah. And I wanted to ask, like you mentioned earlier, when you said you're watching your peer still living that lifestyle um, and this period that you were, um, I guess, facing or transitioning as maybe those were the correct words we can use, which took three years, I guess you also noticed a shift in your friend circle, right? Like who you were associating with and that as a young adolescent, does 20 count as a young adolescent? Yeah. <laughs> like, no, I think, you're pa- I think you're past adolescence, right? Okay, young sorry, we're adult. past adolescence. But you're experiencing similar things, right? Like it's like, ah, your friend groups and your social, you know, and just kind of yeah. like, I have no friends now. Like, this is weird. Like now, you know, they think I'm lame or I, you know, I'm just li- listing out words here, but those are real feelings and real experiences that you dealt with. Definitely. My friendships changed a lot and it was, it was painful. Some friendships ended and there were, there were a few friendships that, that lasted, you know, until now. And so it was also one of those moments where you really get to see what your relationships are based on. Yeah. So once I stopped partying, there were people from, from like my 
people I thought like my best friends to acquaintances that I didn't see anymore. I didn't have contact with because I didn't want to be participating in those activities anymore. And then there were people who I got to see, oh, this relationship is based on the fact that we love each other and we appreciate each other and we respect each other and we value each other and all of those things that I think true relationships are built on. Right. But it was extremely lonely. And that, you know, that was, that was real. It was a real experience. So in the sense that I was finding pathways that I wanted to go on and searching for what I wanted to study and kind of that question of like, okay, well now what, where do I go from here? What does my life look like? And there was inspiration and the happiness of seeing a new path opening for me. There was also a huge amount of loneliness and isolation because I was transitioning out of, you know, a a typical way of existing in your early twenties. There's nothing wrong with that, but it just wasn't the right thing for me anymore. Right. So can you walk us through, so like you, so can you just walk us through that transition from what you said earlier, your early twenties to, you know, at that point, what were you doing? Uh, I guess maybe you were kind of done studying or you were working somewhere or, you know, I guess, I guess like what ideal career path were you thinking of at that time when you (laughs) hit that point? And then, like you said, in those three years of like through the loneliness, through the transitioning, through those experiences, trying to figure out what was next, right? Like what, and you said earlier, you were trying to figure out what you were interested in, what you wanted to study. And I guess if you could just walk us through that, that will then lead us into how you came about to all these different modalities that you've uh, become an expert in, right? (laughs) Yes, I would be happy to. So my path has been very non-linear pretty much since I was a child, you know, since I was a kid, I was never one to kind of follow the the normal roadmap. So when I got sick, I I had just done my first yoga teacher training. So I was really clear. I loved yoga. I got very connected to it um, pro- like around 19. So I was teaching yoga through the time of being sick. You know, it was the kind of thing where I was like, okay, I can muster enough energy to teach a yoga class and that's pretty much it. So I was in my study of yoga. Um, It took me, you know, three years to build really to the point where I could do more. So once I got better or kind of like a sign that I was much more recovered is I went to herb school. So in that period of time of you know, I moved back home. I was just kind of dealing with this situation that was somewhat different. I really realized how much I loved herbs and plants and how curious I was about their healing properties and natural medicine, because I was always someone that didn't do very well with allopathic medicine. Like Western medicine, just, I didn't respond to it. I was very sensitive. I couldn't really take medications as a child. Um, And I didn't grow up in that kind of family. My family is on the much more alternative side. So it was one of those things where I was searching, like, I was like, I need something to be interested in. I need something to just like spark some passion inside of me. I need something to focus on. So I found herbal medicine and did a a nine month course to study and get certified in that. And, you know, it was really just like one step at a time, like really finding like, okay, what's the next thing? What's the next thing? And that, that also led me to women's health and it led me to nutrition because there were things that we would cover in the course and in the school that I was so hungry for more of. I was like, well, I want to know more about food and more about nutrition. And I want to know more about women's health and the menstrual cycle. So for me, I didn't, I didn't have that really clear understanding of what my career path was. And I definitely wanted it, but it's not something that I, I like 
I never got the thing that a lot of people get like, you're going to be <laughs> this. For me, it was much more just like following this, this winding path that at some point, points I really couldn't see what was next like I couldn't see around the next bend and it was like okay do this right now this is the right thing so I went I went about I went about it like that and so would you say that while you were studying these different modalities you were seeing how your own body and system was healing and that it really worked for you right like so um, from your burnt burnt out to, um, you know, studying herbs and in continuing your studies that you're like, like nutrition, you said earlier was really important. And that, that that's very nourishing to helping you heal as well. And how like that applied to understanding your system better. Right. Definitely. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I found, I feel like I found those things because I needed healing. And, you know, when I did, crash the question was what do I do about this how do I help how do how do you heal something like this so I found practitioners I started doing my own research in the sense of like what is adrenal what are the adrenals what is adrenal health I didn't know any of that at that point so it started my own study of how do you heal with natural medicines and nutrition and what is the role of these different things. And then as I started studying them more formally, I a hundred percent noticed benefits. I connected things like we'd be, you know, reading about a chapter, some system of the body. And I would have these moments of, oh my gosh, that's exactly what was happening. I didn't even know Mm -hmm. that's what was going on for me. And I started of course, applying the things to myself, incorporating herbal medicines in my life and my routine and changing the way I ate and the way I thought about food and interacted with food. So I feel that I was my first client in the sense because I also, I don't recommend herbs to people that I haven't tried or that I don't know. And in herbal medicine, you really want to make a relationship with the plant and the herb so you know how it works in the body Mm -hmm. so I had to figure out a lot of that for myself it was like okay well how does this herb help with menstrual cramps and then I would you know I take it for a few months or a few years and then I understand how to recommend it to someone in a more a deeper way than just oh the instructions on the bottle say take this much. Right. So you had to be a guinea pig for that process as well. (laughs) Yeah, I was completely my own guinea pig. I feel that, um, yeah, in health and wellness, you are somewhat your own guinea pig. Mm -hmm. Also because for me, it's really important to feel confident about what I recommend to people. And I found that I had to go through those steps for myself You know, I can't counsel someone about creating a healthy relationship with food or with their body or their menstrual cycle if I also haven't done that work. Yeah. And to be able to to hold a space for someone and to be with them and hear their struggles and say, yeah, I understand. I have my own version. Mm -hmm. So can I then transition us into this conversation of how did you end up picking women's health as your focus and now more recently really positioning yourself in menstrual cycles. Yes, I would love to share about that. So the moment I think that I can remember was in a, I was in a class in herb school about fertility awareness method, which is a method of tracking the menstrual cycle and especially the cervical fluid to know when you're fertile and when you're not fertile. And it was like a light bulb went off. I was (laughs) fascinated. Like I couldn't get enough. I had a hundred questions. I wanted to know everything. I thought it was the most interesting, magical thing. And from there, I just started realizing how much Like we were talking about earlier, how 
women are different. We have a different experience in the world. We have a different experience with healthcare. Our body goes through different unique things. And I realized that the practitioners that I had worked with who really recognized that and worked with me based on my own experience were the most effective. Mm. And I think some of it I think is a mystery. I don't even know where it came from, this very strong passion and wish to work with women's health. But I just started following it from that moment, kind of of realization, learning about the menstrual cycle. I just followed it and I I loved it. And the more I read and the more I studied and the more I looked at things through that lens, the more I realized how necessary it was. Because we are unique. We are different. That w- That's what makes us beautiful. And when we... When we relate to ourselves with that understanding and then we relate to other people, other women with that understanding, I feel it's a it's different. It makes a difference and something something different and magical happens. Mm-hmm. So so what um I guess from your own personal experience um with the menstrual cycle plus how you approach teaching this and advocating for it and working with your clients. Could you share a little bit about that? Yeah. um, I would say one of my main points that I really advocate for, and I feel like it's the foundation of the work that I'm doing now, is I believe that this knowledge is – is empowering. I believe it's something that we really need to reclaim because like we are the we're the holders of this knowledge and I feel that because of so many things modern living the messages that we get from society from culture from the patriarchy from our families from media we 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 discount it and we push it away and we believe all these things about ourselves. Like we internalize these messages that there's something wrong with us. If we have a menstrual cycle, if we're sensitive, if we don't feel sexy and desirable all the time. And then we, we think that that's how we feel about ourselves. So for me, the main thing is to really start talking about it. And to shift that that stigma that we can't talk about our bodies. There's something shameful. There's something gross about it. We have to keep it hidden. Because I feel that from that point comes the self-connection, the self-awareness, the self-love. But like we really got to get in there first and say right. – yes, I, I'm going to feel my body. I'm going to be in my body. I'm going to learn about what it's doing. And I'm going to deal with the things that come up because it's strong. I think that a lot of people and a lot of women especially disconnect from their body and from the menstrual cycle because of experiences, negative experiences that they've had that are very valid you know, trauma or negative experiences with intimacy or just it can be very hard and uncomfortable to be a woman in the world. So I also really respect where that disconnect comes from. Mm. And I really feel that it's time to heal it. Yeah. But also going back to Um, respecting and understanding where the disconnect comes from, that really means that the individual, which is something we talked about before we start recording, needs to be aware of that and willing to explore that, right? Like like they need to be able to explore it and be open to wanting to understand and accept it before they can push forward, right? With with, uh, the growth. Definitely. And that's why I 
I really like to meet people where they are. And for me, sometimes that's baby steps. You know, it's, okay, let's just start tracking your cycle or admitting when you're on your period, letting yourself rest. You know, I think there's baby steps depending on where you're coming from. Yeah. Excuse me, that are are super valid because you can't just, you you know, you can't just break through a wall or dive into a deep, deep lake or something like that, you know? So I think it's also being aware of being, a, you know, having that self-awareness to say, okay, I can start here and I'm going to do this for a little while. And then you get comfortable. And so as things come up or as you realize, oh, wow, I have this issue or this belief or I'm yeah. encountering something that is strong or something I need to look at, you build some confidence and some self-acceptance and compassion to be able to then have that deeper level of self-awareness and say, okay, yeah, I really want to do this work. So I, I'm just curious and I'm, I'm trying to uh, wrap my head around how I want to ask this question because it kind of comes in two different parts. One is uh, normally what kind of individuals seek you for consultation or to work with you on this particular subject matter, right? So menstrual cycle versus like um, the generic women's health, right? So, and how is that, okay, how is that different from just a health coach, for instance? Okay. That's like one question. And I'm just going to throw in my second question before I forget. And you, okay. can, choose how, you can choose how you want to answer, you know, just wanted to address this topic because I, I think it's really important. And I think, uh, you know, you can share with us a little bit more is like from your own experience, you know, as a female growing up was, you know, when you first got your first period, was that your mom helped you understand it, right? Like what information were you fed to understand like, all oh, right, this happens and I need to do this. Or was it, you know, with your, with, was it school? School taught you through sex education, right? Or your other girlfriends, or you, maybe you had some really forward thinking aunt. I don't know, right? Everyone's situation is different. I think for me, it might have been my sister, or maybe it was my mom. I'm not sure. I can't remember. <laughs> but right. So, you know, and that could also be a cultural thing, right? So, because it, it starts when you're young, like that's Definitely. your first experience of this. And, understanding that your body's changing and that this happens every month and how do you I need like you said how do you track it how do you understand like your spotting to you know your whole your whole full day flow until you finish you know and how do you um you know the, the etiquette like san sanitizing right it's kind of like how often should you change your pad if you use pads or how do you use a tampon because you know, if you came to Asia or at least here in Taiwan, I think 20 years ago, you wouldn't see tampons sold at a 7-Eleven convenience store, for instance, right? But now it's very common because, you know, bikini and beachwear is a thing and people do work out now. So culturally that has shifted, right? But back in the day, I, you know, I remember we would have to bring tampons back from the States because they weren't selling it here. Oh, wow. You couldn't, you, know, like, you couldn't even get them. Like, like from you a could, but like, just, it's like hard to find. You know, wow. and then I mean, again, going into further detail, it's like sizes, right? <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, that's so different. interesting. You know, so that's interesting too. Uh, and then I guess you know, to shift from adolescent to you know, obviously for another two decades, you know, we're we're grown up, you know, grown women, and then maybe you get pregnant, and there's a whole shift there. And then after that, if you know, or you don't get pregnant at all, I mean, and you don't have kids, but you know, then you go through menopause, right? So I mean, there are all these very distinct cycles, right? I, I just said so much here. And I know it's a lot of information. No, that's great. I'm gonna, I'm gonna I parse just, it I just, out. Yeah, just uh, I guess for my second question, I'm 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 curious to hear how you would address that, right? In terms of from young women to adolescents to you know, pre-pregnancy, post-pregnancy mens menstruation and the for go for going forth with that. So, yeah, so two well, questions there. <laughs> I guess, okay, so first I want to say that I my interest is really in the whole reproductive cycle and I feel like there is so much to do. I really feel like I'm going to be working for many, many, many years to get to all the areas of interest that I have because I'm very interested in early menstruation. Like we're talking about young girls 
educating young girls, educating parents about how to parent yeah. and work with and understand what's happening for their child. Um, teens is this area that is so rich and I love teenagers and they need so much more uh, medically accurate, non-biased information than they get. Fertility, ever, all those stages that you said, I love them all. And I feel like I'm going to be spending my life to be able to address them all. <laughs> my my first menstruation, you know, I remember my mom, bless her. I love her so much. You know, she told me about it before. Like this, you're heading in this direction. This is what it is. This is what's going to happen. And she said, do you want to do something special for that. She's like, this is a step in life. You're growing up. Do you want to do something? Like, do you want to go to the creek by the house and we'll make you a flower crown? And I'm so embarrassed. I blatantly said no. I was like, no, mom, that's so weird. (laughs) She was like, we can gather, you know, like the women, like, not like kind of not biological aunties, but like the, the older women who I knew who were in my family and kind of supported me. And looking back, (laughs) that's what I want every young menstruating person to have. And I was, I was such a bratty tween. I was like, no way. That's so weird. So I didn't do that. Um, my parents were actually out of town when I got my period and I was with my best friend who I'm still really close with. And she has an older sister. So we learned a lot of things from the older sister in those days. And she was the one who I I wonder I don't see I don't remember everything, but like Yeah, yeah. Showed I mean, me how to long ago. <laughs> showed me how to use the pads, but she also told me a really funny thing that has stuck with me forever is that I could only sleep on my back when I was on my period. Okay. So for I think as especially that first one, I I slept. I mean, people won't be able to see me, but it was like my arms by my side, stiff as a board. I can't turn over. Um I I feel like my mom taught me a lot in the sense of like you were saying, when do you change the pad? How do you use tampons? When do you feel comfortable with that? But I also feel that the messages we get from our peers and from school are so strong. Like I was so embarrassed. I felt like no one can know I'm going to the bathroom to change my pad when that's actually the most natural, normal thing. And I really wish and plan to help young people and young girls feel okay about that and not feel ashamed and mm-hmm. like it's something that you have to hide. So that was that was my first experience and I think yeah, I look back at it fondly and at this point I I laugh about it. I laugh about the the misinformation and and also yeah, I feel like I I just I feel like I was really lucky enough to have some people around me that it just wasn't a big deal. Like I remember my second period I started, I was at like a softball practice and of course it was totally out of the blue. I didn't know when it was going to come. And, you know, one of the moms was just like, oh honey, like it's all good. Like come with me. We're going to take care of you. Go to the bathroom, you know, get you a different pair of shorts. Like I felt like I was surrounded by some good, some good messages as well as the ridiculous messages. Like put on a bikini and go flirt with the boys at the beach when you're on your period, like the Tampax (laughs) commercials, you know? Um, So moving into uh, your other questions, I would say, well, the one I would really like to answer is like kind of what makes this different from health coaching, which is a question I love because I feel that it's very different. I purposefully don't call myself a coach. Because I studied these natural health and natural medicine modalities 
to learn how to work with people in those things. So studying herbology, I studied, okay, what is herbalism? How, how do you work with people as an herbalist? What does that look like? How do you work with someone as a nutrition counselor? How do you work with someone as a yoga teacher, as an Ayurveda instructor? And then for me, I put those things together and it took, it took time and it has gone through various permutations of how it looks and how it's being presented, that bundle of tools and modalities into a cohesive offering. Mm -hmm. But what I find now a lot is that like a health coach course. I don't know exactly what they are because I haven't taken one. But I feel that there's a difference between really understanding natural health systems and systems of the body and really understanding these these fields that are very different like nutrition or herbology or aromatherapy like you said or homeopathy and studying how to work with people in those settings and with those modalities is very different from taking a course that will teach you how to be a health coach. I mean, I don't even know what that means. Also, because I think that it's very individual health, wellness, healing is not a one size fits all. Certain things work for certain people, certain things don't. And I feel that that subtlety of, really learning how to understand what someone needs and then use what you know to create something that works for them is a different type of study and a different offering than coaching. Right. So what kind of individual, or I guess the clients you work with, you know, I guess, how do they pick you, right? Like in terms of like, if someone wanted to work with you or usually how do people shop around for someone like your expertise? Does that make sense? Like your yeah, expertise? Definitely. So like, I mean, right now, obviously, like you said, a uh, health coach or um, executive coaching, you know, the word coach, uh, you, I guess in short nowadays is short for counselors, right? In, in those specified areas. So people tend to be like, oh yeah, maybe I should work with like a, a business coach, you know, someone to help me uh, as an entrepreneur to get me into that path of becoming my own uh, business owner, right? So you work with a business coach or mm -hmm. um, someone who, uh, yeah, wants to be, wants to lose weight. So they work with a health coach. I think that's usually the definition of a health coach, right? You should have healthy habits and healthy, healthy living. So they need someone to kind of guide them through that process. And in your case, not a coach, you work on women's health and making you more holistic as a, as a female. Uh, how do they search for you or what, what, what kind of clients usually come to you? I guess. That's yeah, I guess I do. I do want to say, you know, I'm not trying to like, uh, bash on, on, on coaches, health coaches. I do think, um, like everything, there are people who are working under that title who are super qualified, have so many skills. They really, they really truly know what they're doing. And yeah. they know how to work with people in their yeah. specialty. Yes. And like anything else, there are people who have less training and less expertise and can use that certification to maybe be doing things that they aren't quite ready to do. <laughs> It's because they're very good at marketing and using exactly. social media. Exactly. They have great design <laughs> I'll just, skills. I'll just say it for you. <laughs> it's true. It's so true. And it's hard. I mean, that is definitely a struggle of like, wow, you're a great, you're great at marketing. And so your health coach business is booming. Thriving, and someone yeah. who is like so, so educated and they know their stuff so well is not as skilled at that because it's hard. And that's, that's a tough one. Um, yeah. But it's okay because, you know, as they say, those that align with you will align with you, right? Definitely. So those who are attracted to that, the way I put it is kind of like it filters for you too, right? 
Like it really, it really for, does. Um, for your work too. I mean, the client, and you said this earlier before, again, we recorded is that clients is a big part of it, right? It's a lot of energy too. So if you have someone who is really good at marketing, is really good at putting this concept out there, like planting that seed first, and you have, you have, you know, clients flocking over there because you're like, that's cool. And it's trending and they get an understanding. And then as they evolve and they want more, then they'll come to you. <laughs> right? Exactly. Or talk and to someone who has more depth, who has that knowledge to, you know, so it's, you know, it's a cycle. Yeah. And I find that, I mean, the world needs so much good. It needs so much light. And I feel that, you know, anyone who's helping people live healthier, feel better about themselves, have healthier habits, that's, that's good. That's good in the world. And and like you said, people resonate with different people. So everyone's going to get what they need. Yeah. I find that the clients that come to me are definitely people who are looking to do deeper work, who also recognize that there's non-physical aspects of what they're experiencing in the sense they're like, okay, I'm I'm really struggling with food and eating but I know there's emotional components and I have a history with this and I really mm. need help on that level as well. Or, right. or people who um, are having difficult periods or they're having issues with their menstrual cycle or issues with fertility. And so, I mean, sometimes they seek me out because they're like, oh, that's what you do. You're an expert. But then it also turns out that they're the people who are open to the non-physical aspects because that's important to me. It's something I really love and I find is super effective. It can almost make more impact on the reproductive system when you look at the emotional or the mental or the spiritual aspects as opposed to just like, oh, you have cramps. Let's address the cramps. It's like, okay, but What's going on? Why? Do you rest? Yeah. How do you talk to yourself? How do you feel about yourself? Um, what are you eating? Yeah, what are you eating? Are, what are you doing when you get those cramps? Like, are you trying to push through and go to the gym and then they get worse? Or are you taking the cue from your body that you need to rest and your cramps go away? So I find the people who come to me, I think they, I think they feel that I'm like a safe person as well. And that there's a level of comfort. I hear that a lot. They're like, I just feel really comfortable with you. Like I, I feel they're like, I don't know you, but I want to tell you everything. <laughs> I'm like, that's perfect. That's what we're here for. I'm going to ask you a hundred questions. Um, so I do, I feel that it, it does really filter and it's, it's people who, who are also ready. I find yeah. it's people, they're like, yeah. I've worked, I've worked with this. I've tried this. It hasn't worked or it worked for a few months yeah, And they come to me because they're like, okay, I'm really ready to make some changes. I want it to be holistic. I need, I need some emotional support as well for this journey. Mm -hmm. And that's when it's a really good fit. Awesome. So we're, we're kind of running short on time, but I do have a few more questions before we wrap up. Uh, I want to ask... For those who are listening and, and resonate with your story, I think when you said adre adrenaline collapse, I think we can we you can say burnt out, right? Like that's another way to put put it. Yeah. Burnt so out. yeah, I mean, you know, that's kind of a whole field. What gets talked about a lot is adrenal fatigue, which yeah. actually is not it's not a medically accurate term. term. Mm -hmm. So um, adrenal dysregulation. Like once, once you get to the point of your cortisol has completely dropped and your, your body has like, will not get up and go when you tell it to, you have collapsed. Right. So, so I, I say adrenal collapse. The nicer way is to say adrenal dysregulation or adrenal, okay. adrenal imbalance is like you're tired and you need some help and you should address it at that point. Adrenal okay. collapse is like you kind of fell off the cliff. Cause I feel like that's not a term like I hear often. I feel like people usually say, Oh, like I'm just so burnt out. Like, right. Like, yeah. Burnout is definitely an adrenal issue. 
Yeah, but I don't think people use the terminology adrenal as often, right? It's like usually they get to that point, they're just like, I'm just so burnt out, right? Like, yeah, and, and I, usually, yeah. I talk with people who it's, you definitely get the aha moment when someone yeah. is like, I'm so burnt out. And you're like, well, let me tell you about this <laughs> phenomenon that happens in the body between you go, yeah. <laughs> your brain and your hormones and your adrenals and your nervous system. And when you tell them and you list, these are the symptoms, these are the signs, they are mostly blown away because it explains something that a lot of times, especially in Western, the Western medical model, is looked at as, oh, you're making it up or it's just in your head or it's not that big a deal. Yeah. Or these but symptoms- yeah. These symptoms don't connect. But when you look at it from this other angle, I mean, I've had people cry. They're like, oh my gosh, no one has ever validated this experience. Right. So I guess what I wanted to add on to that is that for those who are listening and resonate with that storyline, but also resonate with the you know menstrual cycle, women's health side, what would you recommend to them to... I guess to bluntly put it, be more intuitive about this whole process uh, and, you know, what resources maybe that you would recommend that they can start looking into or kind of make small changes uh, or build new habits, right. To improve those situations. I would say really start paying attention to how you feel and then that's so hard. <laughs> right there. Right there. I mean, honestly, I'm like, well, and then what? But because that's that's the basis of everything is just paying attention, not just. Paying attention is a lifelong journey and lesson. But I think that by paying attention to how you feel and recognizing recognizing that, I mean, that's really the basis of cycle tracking. You're paying attention to how you feel throughout the month. And then you're connecting that with the place in your menstrual cycle where you are. So just by- And would, would that be the same for men? I mean, they don't go through menstrual cycles, but how should know, they be more I aware? I think that men cycle, and this is like my secret mission at some point in my life, along with all the other missions, is like, I want to do a study and I want to really find out what is the man cycle? Because I believe there is one. I just don't know what it's based on. Um, I think for anyone, man, woman, everything on the spectrum, paying attention to how you feel and just recognizing it. That's the first step. Mm -hmm. Then the next step is like accepting it and not trying to manipulate it and change it. Like you're gathering information. You're like, wow, I'm really tired today or I'm sad or I'm I'm feeling super vulnerable or, oh, I had these plans to go out, but I'm feeling a lot more internal. I just need to be home or just be with like one friend, whatever it is. I think tuning into that and accepting it and being okay with how we feel is hugely transformative and healing in our life. And that's mm -hmm. really where our intuition can come from because – Everyone has intuition. People just listen to it in different ways, like, or not at all. The issue yeah. is not that you don't have intuition. The issue is that it doesn't tell you what you want to hear. And so you don't listen. Yeah. Well, so, also we're just very disconnected to our intuition these days. Yeah. So I think it's like spend time without your phone, go for a walk in nature without listening to music. Like listen to nature, observe the world around you, feel how you feel. Um, I'm a huge, huge supporter, advocate. I recommend some form of meditation to everyone because I think that we really need to cultivate that practice of just sitting with ourself and, and accepting how we feel. Even if it's for five minutes a day, you're like, I'm going to sit and breathe and just feel how I feel and I'm not going to run away from it or try and change it or beat myself up about it. And then that grows, grows to a little bit longer. It grows to being okay with however you are at a certain point in the day or month or whatever. So that's, that's, 
I guess that's how I would tell people to be more intuitive about themselves. It's like, well, you have to be in touch with yourself to be yeah. intuitive about yourself because that's how you get the information. And I know it can be really scary, but I do feel that the idea of what we might possibly feel if we were in touch with ourselves or if we were like aware of how we feel is way scarier than the actual experience of whatever we're going to feel. You know, I think it's like, oh my God, what am I going to encounter? I'm going to be so freaked out. And then we do it and it's like, oh, oh, I'm sad. Or, oh, I'm thinking about something in the past that I didn't resolve. And it's actually okay. Yeah. And and I just wanted to add when you say like to be in touch and be intuitive that I really feel that it's not just the like being with yourself, but also just understanding also your external, right? Like your physical body and your surroundings. So it's a conscious practice of both in and out, right? Like you're inside. So if you sit, like you said, and be in your own thoughts and meditate, but also externally, like how does your physical body feel? I think there's, you know, there's truth to having, be able to connect the two to really oh, sure. channel that intuition. For me, the goal is to be more whole and be more of a holistic being. So when I'm meditating, I'm really trying to tune in to how does my body feel, my emotions, my mind, how's my energy, and the same thing, like going out in nature or even when I'm with people, that's the practice for me is that practice of mindfulness. Like, how am I feeling? You know, where am I at? When's it time to leave? Yeah. Being like very mindful of your surroundings and what you're yeah, doing. Yeah. Like you said, you're inside and outside. Yeah. 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 I'm like mindful inside. I'm mindful outside. I'm mindful when I interact with other people. And that's yeah. a huge practice. These are... These are like yeah. I said, it's they're a like daily, daily practice, lifelong daily, practice, daily lifelong practice. Yeah. So my last question, uh, well, it's actually not my real, my, not my last. I have like a one point five question. <laughs> so you were saying when you, you know, you work with clients, and and I ask, I tend to ask this one for a lot of people who do more client facing work, is how do you preserve your own energy, right? So you're working with people who are telling you a lot of things, you know, uh, you're, I mean, you're not kind of a therapist, but not really a therapist, but you know, it's a lot, right. It's a lot of emotional yeah. stuff. And if you are a intuitive, emotional individual, how do you make sure that, that what people are, I don't want to say dumping on you, but what people are sharing with you does yes. not, you know, you leave, you leave that where it, where it's been shared and you, you know, go home and it doesn't go home with you. Right. So that you yes. create a space where that doesn't drain you um, as Ooh. a practitioner. Uh, and then my last one, usually I say, I would, you know, I always ask like, do you have any books or podcast recommendations that you would share with the listeners that you think are resourceful to engage them in understanding your field better? Um, and also like what keeps you grounded? Ooh. So, if, ooh, so the, you know, those are just a few. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um to okay, wrap so up our conversation today. <laughs> the fir I'm going to go in order. Okay. Such a good question. And it's a practice. It's like anything. It's an ongoing practice. So that's also something that I have, have and still do very actively study because I am very sensitive. So for me, I mean, I, before I go into a session, I have, you know, I have my practices. Like I center myself. I, I meditate for a few minutes, I pray, and I really come into the space of compassion as best I can so that I'm I'm very present and I'm very caring and I but I'm neutral. So for me it's like compassion is is all of those things. It's present, it's caring, it's loving, it's neutral. So I'm not attached to what's being shared and I'm not I'm not trying to fix anyone. I'm really there as a support. I'm there to offer recommendations. I'm there to give advice 
as much as someone can receive it. But right. I find that that's really key. It's like, I don't heal anyone. I'm not trying to fix anyone. These people aren't broken. That's not my job. And yeah. so that also helps me, especially when like someone shares something very strong or or if I do, like we all have our triggers. For me, it's just like compassion, 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 always come back to that space And the more that I'm conscious about setting up that space for myself in sessions, like I light a candle, I I feel better. I feel more clear and I feel like I take on less things. And then after the session, I have a very clear practice where it's like I, you know, after the call or after they've left, I kind of like release them from my space. Like I say goodbye. I say thank you. I consciously... I like, I visualize like them moving out of my space and my aura and I always take a shower. So Uh, I have to, I'm, I'm, I'm very sensitive. I love water. It helps me. And so I always take a, I take a shower after my sessions or if I have, I usually at this point I'm kind of doing like one at a time. So I just build in that space to like cleanse myself. Um. Because it can be a lot and some are really different. You know, it's like yeah. some people are sharing, some people are dumping. It's <laughs> It varies. Um, it sounds like that's also your grounding technique as well to answer totally, that. Totally, yeah. It's, and I, yeah. So I do those things in my life for me, regardless of working with yeah. people. Like yeah. I have my, you know, my meditation practice, my grounding practice where it's like I literally – envision you know my energy going down into the ground and like into the roots of the trees like I I I like visualize the earth and I really connect with that I do all of these things in my life I pray I light candles I I, I do all that kind of stuff um and then the your the books and recommendations right that was the third the third part yeah yeah like what would you recommend to those who are listening to you know get them started if they're curious about menstrual cycles women's health adrenal collapse like um so get them yeah resources that they can look into so there's a there's a doctor she's a she's one of these you know super women we were talking about like when did she ever sleep yeah she's a doctor she's a midwife she's a teacher she's an herbalist she's been doing this for so long her name is aviva rom okay and so not only does her website have tons of resources so many articles but she has two books i think about one is focused on adrenal health and one is focused on thyroid health and she's really she's a an expert in the field and it's very holistic. It's very approachable. It's all about lifestyle and nutrition and taking care of ourselves. So I've studied with her. I learn a lot from her. I think what, and she has a lot of resources about menstrual health, pregnancy, postpartum, everything. I mean, like the woman is a powerhouse of content and information. So I love her. A book that really changed my life and has kind of been like my women's health Bible is by Christiane Northrup. She's a doctor, really a pioneer in women's health in the 80s who basically moved modern medicine in the direction of women's health. So her body, um, women's bodies, women's wisdom it's a, it's a, it's a thick book, but it's, I, it's incredible. I, I've learned so much from it. I always go back to it. You know, it goes through the whole reproductive cycle, talks about sex. It's awesome. Um, okay. And then I have more. (laughs) Is that good enough? Um, sure. I mean, you can, how about I'll give you, you can list two more. <laughs> okay, perfect. I only have two more. Um, okay, great. <laughs> I would say Claudia Welch, Balance okay. Your Hormones, Balance Your Life is a great book. She's bringing Eastern 
medicine and Ayurveda together. Also super simple, very approachable. And then there's a woman, she she practices Ayurveda long time. Her name is Maya Tiwari. Mm-hmm. And she has many books, but she has a book called, I think it's called like Women's Healing Through Spirituality or something like that. Okay. Um, Women's Health Through Spiritual Healing, something like that. It's beautiful. It's herbal medicine, Ayurveda, mantras. She gets into all kinds of very cool practices with the moon and herbs and um, just kind of a different Fine. angle. Okay. So those, those are, those are my go-tos. Those are the thing that I also always go back to and I like read okay. and study from them and. Okay. Yeah. Nice. I will put all those in the episode resources as well as your website and I'll, also say that you're going to start your online course in May, uh, May of yes, this year. I so am. I, yeah. So we'll, you know, do a little promotion. I guess we can share that as well. And so people can learn more about you and what you do and, and, and also the course. Cool. Uh, I would appreciate that so much. <laughs> we we can go. keep going. I know there's so, there's, I know there's so much to cover, I know. but um, I think this is a great, great start to understanding, uh, you know, you and also what you do and more about these different um, areas and knowledge. So thank you so much for your time, Zara. Thank you so much. This was lovely. That's all we have time for today. Thank you for listening to Curito Connects. For more Connects content, collaborations, and discoveries set to inspire you on your own individual journey, please head to our website at www.curito.co. Until next time, stay inspired and thank you for joining us at Curito Connects.